Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video, we're going to look at the fixed point iteration that we can use to solve scalar nonlinear equations. We'll first look at the convergence properties of fixed point iterations, and we'll then look at a particular example. Suppose we define an iteration xk plus 1 is equal to g of xk, and we've already seen this at several points before in the course. For example, with Heron's method for finding the square root of a number a, we can write down that xk plus 1 is equal to a half times xk plus a divided by xk. And this would fit with our definition if we use g heron of x is equal to a half times x plus a divided by x. Now, suppose that there's a value alpha such that g of alpha is equal to alpha. Then we call alpha a fixed point of g. And if we look at g heron, then we can see that the square root of a will be a fixed point. And if we calculate g heron of the square root of a, that will give us a half times the square root of a plus a divided by the square root of a, and that will just evaluate to the square root of a. A fixed point iteration will terminate once a fixed point is reached, since we'll have that xk plus 1 is equal to xk, and therefore all subsequent xk will be equal to the same value. Now suppose that our iteration xk plus 1 is equal to g of xk converges as k tends to infinity. And let's also suppose that g is continuous. Then it must converge to a fixed point. And to see this, let's write down that alpha is equal to the limit as k tends to infinity of xk then we can write down then that alpha is equal to the limit as k tends to infinity of xk plus 1, and that will be equal to the limit as k tends to infinity of g of xk, and by continuity we can write that as g of the limit as k tends to infinity of xk, and that will just be equal to g of alpha, and therefore we see that this limit must be a fixed point. Hence, for example, if we know that Heron's method converges, then it will converge to the square root of a. And it would therefore be very useful if we could guarantee that our fixed point iteration will converge. And to do this, we can make use of a Lipschitz condition that we previously used in unit 3. And suppose that our function g satisfies a Lipschitz condition on the interval from a to b. Then we can find a positive constant l such that for any two values x and y within this interval from a to b, the magnitude of g of x minus g of y will be less than or equal to L times the magnitude of x minus y. And if L is strictly less than 1, then we call g a contraction. So there's a useful theorem that we can prove. Suppose now that alpha is a fixed point of g, and let's suppose that g is a contraction on a neighborhood surrounding alpha. So specifically, it's a contraction on the region from alpha minus a to alpha plus a for some constant a. Suppose also that our initial starting point for iteration, x0, is within this region. So the magnitude of x0 minus alpha is less than or equal to a. Then we can guarantee that our fixed point iteration will converge to alpha. And to prove this, let's look at the magnitude of xk minus alpha. That will be equal to the magnitude of g of xk minus 1 minus g of alpha. And using our Lipschitz condition, that will be less than or equal to L times the magnitude of xk minus 1 minus alpha. And applying this repeatedly shows us that the magnitude of xk minus alpha is less than or equal to L to the power of k times the magnitude of x0 minus alpha. And since L is less than 1, we can see then that the magnitude of xk minus alpha will tend to 0 as k tends to infinity. And therefore we can conclude that xk will tend to alpha. Note here that to complete this proof, we require that all of the xk are within this region from alpha minus a to alpha plus a, and that will indeed be true. 
In addition, we can see from this proof that each time we perform an iteration, the error between xk and alpha will decrease by a factor of l. So now suppose that our function g is in c1 of a and b. Then we can obtain a Lipschitz condition by looking at the derivative of g. Specifically, we can define that L is the maximum of the magnitude of g prime. Now we can use this result and show that if the magnitude of g prime of alpha is less than one, then there is a neighborhood of alpha on which g is a contraction. And that tells us that we can verify the convergence of a fixed point iteration by checking the gradient of g at the fixed point. Let's look at proving this. So by continuity of g prime, and hence continuity of the magnitude of g prime, then we know that for any epsilon greater than zero, there is this delta greater than zero, such that if x is within a distance of delta of alpha, then the magnitude of the magnitude of g prime of x minus the magnitude of g prime of alpha will be less than or equal to epsilon. And therefore, we can conclude that if x is within a distance of delta of alpha, then the magnitude of g prime of x will be less than or equal to the magnitude of g prime of alpha plus epsilon. Now suppose that the magnitude of g prime of alpha is less than one. And we can set epsilon to be half of one minus the magnitude of g prime of alpha. And therefore, there is a neighborhood on which g will be Lipschitz with L equal to a half times one plus the magnitude of g prime of alpha. Therefore, L is less than one and hence g is a contraction on a neighborhood of alpha. Let's now look at the ratio of errors between successive steps. So this will be the magnitude of xk plus one minus alpha divided by the magnitude of xk minus alpha. And that will be equal to the magnitude of g of xk minus g of alpha divided by the magnitude of xk minus alpha. And we can see that this matches our typical definition of a derivative and therefore as k tends to infinity, this will tend to the magnitude of g prime of alpha. And hence, asymptotically, we can see that the error will decrease by a factor of the magnitude of g prime of alpha each iteration. So suppose now that we look at the limit of ratios of errors between successive steps. So if this limit is equal to a number mu, that is greater than zero and less than one, then we say that our iteration converges linearly. If this limit is equal to zero, then we say that our iteration converges superlinearly. We can use these ideas to construct practical fixed point iterations for root finding and solving the equation f of x is equal to zero. And as an example, let's look at f of x is equal to e to the x minus x minus two. And if we plot this function, then we see that it has a root around x is equal to 1.15. And if we rearrange our equation f of x is equal to zero, then we can see that it's equivalent to x is equal to log of x plus two. And therefore, we could seek a fixed point of the iteration xk plus one is equal to log of xk plus two. So in this case, g of x is equal to log of x plus two, and therefore g prime of x is equal to one divided by x plus two. And we see that g prime will be less than one if x is greater than minus one. So therefore, if we start our fixed point iteration at x zero greater than minus one, then we should have convergence. And we will get linear convergence and the factor will be given by g prime of about 1.15 and that is approximately equal to 0 0.32. We could also write down an alternative fixed point iteration and rewrite our function f of x equals zero in a different way to obtain that xk plus one is equal to e to the xk minus two. 
And in this case, g of x would be equal to e to the x minus 2. And g prime of x is equal to e to the x. And we see here then that the magnitude of g prime of alpha will be greater than 1. And therefore, for this fixed point iteration, we can't guarantee convergence. And in fact, the iteration will diverge. So let's now take a look at a Python example to compare these two different iterations. Let's now take a look at the program it.py that demonstrates the two Canada fixed point iterations for finding a root of the function f of x, which is equal to e to the x minus x minus 2. And our first candidate is xk plus 1 is equal to log of xk plus 2. And our second candidate is xk plus 1 is equal to e to the xk minus 2. And if we look at this program, we first define our function f, and we then choose starting values for our two iterations at 1.15. We then perform 20 steps of the two iterations, and we use xa to perform the first candidate and xb to perform the second candidate. And each step we print out the values of xa and xb and the corresponding function values. And if we have convergence to a root, then those function values should become small. So let me now go ahead and run this program. And we see that the program currently gives a math error, and this is due to a rapid divergence in our second candidate iteration. And because we are taking these repeated exponentials, then this can rapidly go out of range and we can hit an overflow error. So let's now modify this program to only use the first candidate iteration. And if we run this first candidate, then now we see that we're indeed converging to a root. And if we look at the values of f at the xk that are computed, then we see that they are rapidly getting small. In addition, in our analysis, we saw that we expected that the error at each step of this iteration would be multiplied by a factor of 0.32. And since 0.32 squared is approximately 0.1, that means that we would expect an additional digit of accuracy for every two iterations. And indeed, we see that every two iterations, the errors that we see in our f are going down by an additional factor of 10. So therefore, as expected, we have a convergent fixed point iteration in this case.